We are back for part two of reading nutrition science research and today I do have the same header slide as before. We will justify where you're obtaining your nutrition information, differentiate between pop culture resources versus scientific resources for nutrition, we'll describe a variety of scientific studies used in nutrition research, and we'll evaluate the quality of human nutrition research and nutrition communication and its relevance to human health. And as I promised, I'm trying to make my videos a little bit shorter so that you can watch them multiple times and you can focus in on exactly what outcomes you need from that video. So today we're gonna to really dig into describing a variety of scientific studies used in nutrition research and evaluating the quality of that research. So the second two bottom points in particular. If you haven't um, watched the first video, I'd recommend taking a look at that first. So let's jump into part two here. Retrospective studies. So as, as we talked in the previous video how we may be going into one of these scientific databases like PubMed or like Google Scholar and looking up some of the different research papers that are in there. And oftentimes you'll find the abstracts, but what we're seeing now more and more, in, especially in PubMed, is that they are using some descriptors to, dis, uh, to tell you what kind of paper you're seeing. So let's start with the first one, retrospective studies. These are also known as case control studies, and they're looking at historical med medical records. So think about this. If you are a nutrition um, scientist and you are thinking about, I don't know, let's say eating kale is good for cardiovascular disease, you'd be looking at interviewing subjects and say, how often do you eat kale? Oh, you eat kale every day? You eat kale five times a day? Fantastic. And you would then look at their historical medical records and say, oh, okay, based off of us interviewing a thousand people, we have the different, uh, the different uh, quartiles, let's say the, the highest consumers of kale versus the lowest consumers of kale. And we'd be able to then do some assessments saying, hey, can we look at your medical records? Oh, the people who are eating the most kale have the best health outcomes, the least cardiovascular disease, the least amount of diabetes, etc. And the people who eat the least amount of kale have the most cardiovascular disease. The challenge is that oftentimes when scientists are doing these kinds of surveys, it's hard for people to remember exactly what they ate. And oftentimes they will lie. And it's you, you can't force people under oath to tell you exactly what they were eating. And the other piece of this puzzle is this retrospective study People don't have good memories. People can't remember uh, their physical activity and their calories burned. And oftentimes you can't tease out the aspects of um, correlation versus causation. I have a slide coming up in a minute to uh, explain what I mean. But um, correlation just means you see data going in the same direction for two or more phenomena. So let's say kale. People who eat kale are likely to have better health outcomes, but are people who eat kale also likely to be the sorts of people who exercise and think deliberately about their diet and eat more fruits and vegetables overall? And are those impeding the results? We may see correlation, but we can't say that kale caused the Im improvement in the health. That's the challenge of a retrospective study. Now, how about a prospective study? Now, instead of looking backwards at historical data and um, survey tools of what people did in the past, now we are going to instead give a treatment and follow people using that treatment forward in uh, over multiple years. And from there, we can start to gather lifestyle and diet and medical information. And so these, uh, these sorts of prospective studies have taken place more so in the United States, they have collected what's called the NHANES data sets, the, natural, or the National Health um, and Aging Health, or uh, I'm going to mess this up, NHANES, look it up, N-H-A-N-E-S, NHANES, they are collecting all this data and they are, um, uh, over time, they're having people check in and they're 
participating in data collection of their health and of their wellness, and they participate in different uh, survey tools where they are um, being monitored for what they're eating and how much physical activity they're participating in. And um, in the United States, they are using these little uh, transport trucks driving around. <laughs> they're not little. And they're like mobile medical clinics collecting uh, collecting um, information on the health and wellness. And you're going to laugh because I'm looking it up on my other device. N the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And so NHANES has been helpful because they can collect these enormous data sets. But again, correlation is not causation. Just because you see that a population is eating more fruits and vegetables or eating less meat doesn't necessarily link it specifically to the biochemistry. The more we see correlation, the more likely we are going to be able to provide causation, but it's not necessarily the same. This is a, uh, this is a fun web page if you want to have fun uh, just looking at correlations and how it's easy as a data scientist to say, well, I see a trend, therefore it must be, uh, it must be cause. Um, in this case, we see U.S. crude imports from Venezuela on the blue line that's running along here at the top. And we see per capita consumption of high fructose corn syrup. And the two lines have a reasonable correlation. Um, but you can't say that one or the other is causing the other. You can't say that because we're importing crude from Venezuela that our per capita consumption of high fructose corn syrup is, is decreasing. Um, the two do not link. And it's very tempting for scientists to be able to make that correlation. Here's another one. The per capita consumption of sour cream has a, has a reasonable level of correlation. In this case, a p-value of 0 0.92, which is quite decent correlation. It's not st statistically relevant, but it's, a, it's tempting to say, well, my p-value is point, uh, 0.92. Therefore, there is cause between per capita consumption of sour cream and motorcycle riders being killed in uh, transport accidents. And now, uh, no, the two don't link. And so I'm, I know I'm being facetious. I know I'm, I'm being sarcastic right now. But there's so many times within this, uh, the nutrition literature where uh, scientists are alluding to that causation or, or, or you will see nutrition organizations, um, food companies, look at the scientific literature and they will try to impose causation. And you can't do that. You just, it's, uh, do not do that. How about this one? Randomized control trials. This is where you are planning an experiment and you are trying to eliminate bias. And bias is just where you, as the research team, you are imposing your idea. So for example, I keep talking about eating kale. If you were to give one group kale salads all the time and you were to give another group only, um, let's say, iceberg lettuce salads all the time. And meanwhile, the kale group was in there going, oh, you get the kale. That's awesome. This is the good one. You are influencing the outcomes. And so it is important to think about how you're randomizing and in, uh, removing bias within the within the experimental design. So in typical randomized control trials, you will have half a group take one treatment and half a group that has a different treatment. And in, 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 and I don't always say that there's two treatments, but um, in some cases there's three or four different treatments. But uh, you split the group so that you have a group that does not get the treatment that's expected and another group that does. And you're supposed to try and prevent people from knowing what treatment they had and control all of those external influences. This is far more easy to manage in terms of um, starting to see the, the statistical causality, but you can start to see how there's a lot of logistics involved in doing these randomized control trials. And so the groups of people participating start to decrease. It gets harder to manage all of the um, ethics and all of the um, research outcomes. And so the cost of doing research on randomized control trials starts to increase considerably. But the nice thing about randomized control trials is that you can authenticate the impact and start to uh, lean towards causality.
Now, double-blinded randomized control trials, these are the this is the best of the best in terms of human subject research. This is where you've got subjects in the study and and both the subjects and the researcher are unaware of which treatment is being used. So there can't be that bias by the researcher where they're going, ooh, I know you have the kill cell, good for you, you get to um, see benefits. You're using coding and masking to prevent people from knowing which samples they're getting. Um, years ago, when I was in my grad studies, I was helping out um, a little bit on a study where they were feeding people muffins and some of the muffins had soy in them and some of the muffins did not. And nobody knew which muffins. They just knew that they got a muffin with a barcode on it, on it and they had to eat the muffin. And the researchers didn't know and the subjects didn't know. And they had to eat these muffins for three years and go in and have their bone density scanned for osteoporosis. They got to eat muffins for years, just different barcoded muffins. And at the end, they, uh, after three years of eating muffins and having their completed bone scans, they were told which muffin treatment they had. Did they have the soy muffin or the no soy muffin? But uh, double-blinded randomized control trials are the ideal way to start to determine causality. But as you can guess, smaller cohorts of people, you can't have hundreds and hundreds of people because it's so complex to execute the studies properly. But this is one of the best types of studies that you can have. Now, meta-analysis, this is where you're taking multiple studies and you're making comparisons against those different studies. So the, the people who are doing meta-analyses, these are research scientists, and they will ask for the data sets from the original scientists who did the original papers. And then they'll use different um, uh, statistical scoring methods to rank the impacts of the different studies. And, they, and, and what's cool about a meta-analysis is that you can pool multiple studies together and you can start to make even better conclusions about causality. And this is a really complex field of study. There's a lot of data analysis and statistics involved. But uh, again, I know the folks who are taking this, this class are in first year of the college program. I want you to just be aware of the, the, the types of research that are out there and the benefits of reading one style of paper over another. So I don't expect you to do a meta-analysis. I expect you to know if you found a paper that said this was a meta-analysis performed, that you know, especially if it was from a high quality paper, that that meta-analysis is going to be really good information about the conclusions that you could draw. Now, similar to a meta-analysis, a review article summarizes the current science and it collects a bunch of peer-reviewed articles, but it doesn't have the same statistical analysis. And it's more like, it's more like curated content that's summarizing the data and sometimes doing a bit of, um, analysis, but not the mathematical analysis. It will sometimes draw conclusions to say, in this first paper, they said kale was good, uh, a good source of antioxidants. In the second paper, kale is a good source of carotenoids. In this third paper, kale is a good source of dietary fiber. Therefore, we conclude kale is a healthy thing to eat. But it doesn't do that same mathematical or statistical analysis to show causation from uh, that collection of, of information. But review articles are often a great gateway for people to do um, reading in nutrition science because it's a summary. You've, you've had a scientific team pull together a wide variety of different reading and they've pulled the most important information from that reading and summarized it for you in a nice, um, in a nice tight form. And honestly, I often say to students who are doing a bit of literature review, I say, start by screening in PubMed just for reviewed articles and see what you can find within the review articles first. Read those first and then see if you see certain authors emerging, certain research institutions emerging. See if you uh, see certain styles of research emerging. And then you can start to dig into that second layer of, of research at the, uh, with the primary articles to see what you can find out more. So review articles have a really great um, role to play in terms of curating that content. But don't go and um, ideally make all of your conclusions based off of the review articles. Review articles, though, can be incredibly important if you're doing, let's say, a regulatory application for trying to make a new health claim. 
Ooh, cell culture studies. I used to do a lot of cell culture studies. And honestly, this is, it's a fun and interesting field of study. What you're doing is you're growing cells on Petri dishes or in flasks. And these are cells that are, most of the time they're from cancer cells because those cancer cells are incredibly hard, hardy, and they're very difficult to kill. And they're, they're easy to grow up in um, these flasks. They are finicky and they're easy to misidentify and become contaminated. And so I've seen a lot of retractions in cell culture studies because they found that when they did the actual genotyping on the cells that they, they weren't actually using the right type of cells. They are so hard to mix up and misidentify. The other thing about cell culture studies, you've got a Petri dish with cells growing in it and it's not the context of a real person. If you are a real person, you're eating that food. It has to be absorbed into your into your body. Um, the nutrients have to be bioavailable. And if they're bioavailable, they you also have to consider, are they modified by different cytochromes or are they changing in the digestive process? Are they being broken down or having um, different ligands added to them to improve their availability to the body? And so as such, just pouring the extract of something on a cell doesn't necessarily mean it's representative of what goes on in the actual body. And so you do need to be aware of, of that and uh, make that into part of your consideration. Cell culture studies do have an important role to play in um, biochemistry research and in pharmaceutical research. But in nutrition science, it's, it's um, controversial. There are important cell culture studies and there are important outcomes that have come from cell culture. They're, they're, it's fantastic for rapid screening large numbers of different food products using cell culture. You don't have to set up hundreds or thousands of, of human studies. And as such, you can screen and target the best, um, the best products that you may want to move forward to human studies. But um, you do have to be really aware that cell culture can be abused um, within the laboratory setting and you want to find groups that are um, have a high level of maturity for being able to deliver cell culture studies consistently over time. So be aware if it says um, an in vitro study or a cell culture study was done and this is the outcome, you really can't make any conclusions necessarily about the human health impact. And so be extremely wary of that. Oh, in vitro studies are sometimes uh, cell culture studies are grouped with in vitro studies, but the idea behind in vitro means that you are running a chemistry or biochemical chemistry study in glass. In vitro means in glass. And so, for example, one class of studies that was done extensively was antioxidants, where they would take the extracts of different foods and they would test them against different um, different biochemical uh, measures. So measuring the oxidation of fats or measuring the oxygen radical absorbance capacity or measuring the ability to change iron from uh, ferric to ferrous uh, in a ferric reductase um, assay. Honestly, uh, all of the in vitro studies were done and um, the United States Department of Agriculture pulled all of its antioxidant data because they said there was no, no correlation to the human system. And a lot of food companies were abusing that antioxidant data, saying, oh, well, this is a great source of antioxidants. Well, ironically, in, in the USDA database, one of the highest dietary sources of antioxidants was Oreo cookies um, because of all of the browning that had gone on in the, the, the biscuit. And Meanwhile, you can't go out there and say eating Oreo cookies is a good source of antioxidants. So the, the, some of these in vitro studies have no relationship to human systems. And so you have to be really wary in the nutrition science. If you're saying, well, based off of this in vitro study where they were doing test tube type experiments, you can't make that correlation. You can't make that correlation. And so many food companies were, especially back in the 90s, so be extremely wary of that. Oh, anecdotal evidence. Uh, I'm sure you've all met someone where they've written an article and they say, well, I ate this and this made me feel really, really good. Therefore, I'm, I am think this is fantastic. I have worked with, with uh, entrepreneurs who have said, you know what, this lifestyle change that I made for myself has been wonderful. And I want everyone to have the same lifestyle change by the food products that I've made. You can't do that. That is anecdotal evidence. 
And so just because you have seen an impact in your own life doesn't mean you can have the ability to make a health claim. Anecdotes are not case controlled. There are no blending of treatments. There's no control of variables. And you can't, dis you can't differentiate it between the placebo effect. As you know, the placebo effect is that aspect where when you go and say, oh, I'm taking this and therefore I'm feeling better. Um, the placebo effect is that aspect that oftentimes your wishful thinking will actually make you feel better. And uh, this YouTube link here is out to a Jimmy Kimmel video where he goes and interviews people and says, tell me about your gluten-free diet. Because these people are like, yeah, I eat gluten-free. It makes me feel so good. And then they have no idea what they're talking about. And it's kind of fun. It's comedy. One last uh, area that I want to talk about here before I do a quick summary here is one area that nutrition science often talks about is risk reduction. And so you'll read a study and they'll say, well, the risk of cancer is reduced by 25%. Um, I, I remember the first time I gave this slide presentation. It was, it was when the World Health Organization had just put out a, it just put out a, a report with the um, IARC, International Agency for the Reduction of Cancer, and it was about eating meat. And we were discussing the eating meat issue in class. And they were saying, well, eating less meat will reduce your risk of cancer by 25%. But you have to think about the lifetime risk of getting cancer, not just, not just the, uh, that now 25% of the population is not going to get cancer. So you have to think first, what is the population risk? So in, uh, in the certain case of cancer, it may be one in 50 people will have a lifetime risk of getting that specific cancer. So now you have 2% of the population with a lifetime risk of getting that cancer. If you have a 25% reduction of risk of cancer, now it's not one in 50, it's 0.75 or 25% reduction in that. So 25% risk and reduction is 0.75 in 50 or 1.5% of the population. It's not the same as having 25% net within the population reducing the risk. So you have to be really careful about how you are explaining this because the general public doesn't necessarily understand risk very well. I have other slideshows that talk about risk assessment and risk management in food manufacturing systems, and I don't specifically talk about risk adjustment, but understanding the risk of different activities occurring and how you reduce that risk is really, really abstract and difficult for people to understand. And so do be really aware. Don't just go out there and say, well, not eating potato chips is going to reduce my risk of, of uh, hiccups by 40%. Well, it's not as clear as that, you have to dig deeper. And I can't stress this enough, ask a lot of good questions and reach out to the scientific community. I realize the class that this is for is a first year college class and um, we will have more levels of complexity added through the years. But for now, be aware that if they say percent risk reduction, you have to think of it as an absolute risk reduction, not just the percent. This is, uh, the, these last summary slides are from an article in the Globe and Mail that was published by Leslie Beck, and it came out a couple years ago, but the, the, the content's still extremely relevant. She wrote an article for the Globe and Mail. The Globe and Mail is one of Canada's largest uh, uh, daily newspapers, and she just happens to have a registered dietitian's background and a scientific reporter's background. And so I do respect her writing quite well. So she, she had written this article saying, how do you read the headline news to understand its impact on nutrition? So her first quote was, does the story report the results of one single study or does it reference other studies on the same topic? Think about how large the study is. If it only had a couple people in it, let's say 10 or 20 people, the results could be due to chance and not apply. So if you see hundreds or thousands of people involved, then you have a much better sense that this is convincing. Now, if you had 10 or 20 people in a uh, double-blinded randomized control trial, you know that that's going to be a, a reasonable quality. But think about who those 10 or 20 people are, too. Are they all middle-aged men? Or are they all elderly women? Think about that context, too. 
who are the people in that study and is it relevant to the population or is it just relevant to a certain segment of the population? Ooh, can the results be generalized to you? Findings in a study conducted on a group of men might not work on male, women or children. I didn't talk about animal studies, but a lot of nutrition studies are in animals. And is a mouse or a rat or, yeah, in some cases, uh, there are even nutrition studies done on different uh, uh, genetically modified organisms, bacteria, yeast, and so on, to look at uh, biosynthetic pathways or uh, biochemical pathways. Are the organisms that the research has been done on relevant to you? So if a nutrient impacts the health of mice, it might not impact you. And many of the digestive pathways and the um, bioavailability pathways are not the same. Did the study look at a real disease or did it look at a marker of a disease? So in some cases, they'll be looking at... Um, so for example, heart attack, but they may be saying, well, we're not looking at heart attack. We're actually looking at inflammatory C-reactive protein, or we're looking at um, different biomarkers. Biomarkers don't mean disease. And so look at nutrition science that actually has Im impact on the actual disease and not necessarily on the biomarkers. Now, that said, many of these biomarkers are well linked, but again, reviewing and thinking about the scientific literature puts your credence more on the ones that actually measure disease-based outcomes. Who paid for the research? And so oftentimes this is in small print, but uh, also take a look at who that researcher is and uh, identify where their funding sources are coming from. Oftentimes researchers will list who their funders are. So identify, is the study partially or fully paid for by a company who makes or sells foods or supplements? And if they are, then they have a, in, uh, some form of bias that may influence the outcome. Who is reporting the results? So large papers, large broadcast stations have scientific reporters and they are trained. Oftentimes they have um, bachelor's degrees or advanced graduate degrees in science so that they can help interpret that science and um, communicate it effectively. If it's a fly-by-night blog or a personal journal or something of that sort, inevitably most uh, post-secondary institutions will, uh, will publish who their staffs are and you can find out who is involved with different research teams. Oh, that's the end for that. So again, um, as we're delving into more and more uh, investigations in the scientific into the scientific research, we will be delving into how do we start to make health claims and we will have to read some of that scientific li literature. I will want you to start to make some of those judgments and justify why you are reading what you are and, and be able to judge and appraise the information that's in there based off of the quality of the paper. All right, so that's the end of this slideshow and Take care and we will talk to you soon. Um, I always love your feedback and I appreciate the really good positive feedback um, to make these videos better and make them more relevant to you. So thank you. I appreciate all of the all of the good effort that you are putting in by watching these videos and thank you for your encouraging words and we'll talk to you again real soon. Cheers.